kind of a short hallway. Very small landings, right? So um, this is where the tactical implications come in, into play. So uh, let's say, Adrian, you arrive first, you announce we have a uh, alcove, three-story alcove apartment. Um, and an, a later arriving unit's coming in, and for some reason you're gonna have them stretch the hose line. What is your, what is your hose stretch look like going on one of those little landings that's about this wide by, you know, like yeah. Ha, have you guys thought about that? Like how, how do you stretch your hose in that small of an area? Um, and, like we usually do like a circle. Yeah, you do it. Yeah, you do a, a coil, right? Yeah. Um, but if you, I mean, that's pretty good to know, like, oh, when I go, when I'm stretching this, I'm going to do a coil right there. So that might affect how I load the hose on my shoulder, et cetera, right? Then bring a couple extra hose bundles to be safe. Right. Yeah, it, it will, but you already have an idea in your head, what is this going to look like for me at the task level? I'm on uh, a truck or I'm going to be probably assigned primary. What does that look like to me? Well, um, it's going to be jammed up there. It's going to be a bottleneck at, the, at that door. Uh, so I may not be able to get in. I might, maybe we have to go in um, uh, VS from the Charlie side or something. Or fire's taken over that alcove. There's no access in. Now I know that I'm going to be doing my primary by VES, probably from the Charlie side. If this exists. Oh, do we have a, we don't have a one-sided? All right, so this is what an alcove looks like. Pretend that the alcove only exists on one side. So fire in the alcove, um, and first floor fire, doors open. It's taken over that whole alcove. Where do these people go? If, forget that this is here. They'll go back here to the window or a balcony, right? So you have, they've got pretty good luck there. They, and we, we should expect uh, that we'll find people back here that need rescue. Mike, so. If you advance two slides, you can show a demonstration of the fire conditions in the alcove. Oh. No, that's not. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is what I'm talking about. It's taken over the alcove. If I've got an alcove, if I don't have an alcove on the back side, I could have a lot more options for people to get rescued. There'll probably be windows here. If I have an alcove on the, on the back side, and this is one of the things you want to identify, is this a front side, back side alcove, or just a one side? Because that kind of changes things. Yeah, uh, so you, you'll probably have some windows here, but these people are, are way more in jeopardy than if this didn't exist, right? So. You can see how understanding what that layout looks like can affect your decision making, give you, we know that when there's a fire, there's time compression. And, and you've got this wedge of time where uh, you're running out of options. And you want to take care of as much stuff as you can at that wide end of the wedge when you have more time to think about it. Knowing this ahead of time, when you're, when you're coming in, you get that initial report, gives you some time to pre-plan, think about what you're gonna be doing at the task and tactical level. Uh, what else about alcos? Um, limited room, like I said. Uh, era, we see these typically in the 70s and on. Typically, it's going to be wood frame, right? So that's alcove. Here's an example. You can see the small balconies. Uh, one of the things to consider uh, also, if, if you're on the attack line, first floor fire, We've got a really good rip and fire in this apartment, and you send someone, you're going to, who's most threatened after uh, people in here? Right above, right? So we're going to send someone up here. Well, you need to think about that uh, when you're sending them up there. You need to make sure you clear this alcove before you open that door to that fire apartment. Because if you don't, this is what happens. You get fire comes out and go fills the alcove. If you have a water slide problem, you have a delay in water slide and leaving the fire apartment door open. Uh, this was a, a guy that uh, well, this is a mannequin. This is his turnouts uh, from a fire in an alcove apartment. He went up the stairs. His partner was having problems with his helmet. He left his helmet. Yeah, something. He gets to the top of the stairs. They open the door to the, to the fire apartment and. He's faced with a couple of choices. I, was the door locked upstairs? I can't remember. 
he decided to run back down through the fire. And so it did pretty good damage to his uh, turnouts. He had some minor burns. Uh, I don't think they're first degree. But anyway, regardless, control that door until you verify that the guys above you have made entry and are safe. And if you're the guy going in above, close the door behind you. Uh, the next style is breezeway. So you guys understand that. Uh, where's our breezeway? Right here. Okay. Uh, you can have a single breezeway right through the middle, and you'll have four apartments per floor accessed. Uh, or you can have two breezeways and four each. You can also have a kind of a combination of breezeway and alcoves. We see this a lot. So you'll have alcoves on Bravo and Delta. Um, the, this um, same situation here, you're walking out of your apartment directly, so you're outside, but you can still be trapped because fire can take, overtake that, uh, that breezeway. Um, it's a lot better in the center hall, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, the products can bend to the exterior. The, the mindset that we had in coming up with the categories was it doesn't really matter what your job is in the fire department. If you're the chief, if you're a driver, if you're a backstep firefighter, when you hear that, like, what's your back stretch and your hose look like in a breezeway? It's a lot better than an alcove, right? So you, you're, you're able to listen to what's going on and kind of pre-plan in your mind, give you a little bit more time while you're responding to the station or responding to the scene to kind of have a little bit of a mental picture of some of the challenges you might run into. If you're a chief that's going to be the IC of this incident, <clears throat> understanding what type of building it is, and I remember doing this responding, thinking about how I'm going to break up my ICS structure to minimize radio traffic. Because if I can set up my command structure where my functional supervisors can face-to-face -face communicate, I just saved a bunch of radio traffic. And if one of you guys is in the IDLH and needs to call a mayday, and I have less radio traffic, you can get out. If I haven't done a good job of setting up my command structure and there's just radio traffic, radio traffic, radio traffic, it's hard to be able to get out when you're made it, right? So literally from every position uh, on the fire, the, the fire department, there's an implication. And the research paper actually goes a little bit more into depth as to what the implications are from the different styles. Yeah. Should, I, should I be going a little more in depth? Or no, do I we just have to... want to make okay. sure that they realize that's kind of the, the big picture. I mean, you did mention you know, there's a reason. That yeah. Uh, who here might be an IC on a fire like this? Okay, so the way, uh, so this was our first Edgewater fire where I was first in, and he had, well, I had everyone assigned when he arrived, so we had four engines and one truck assigned before I transferred command. He made the second NBC uh, in charge of division that was, included the entire alcove. So anything, and he called it Division Alpha, uh, and he was responsible for all apartments all three floors uh, that are accessed by this breezeway. And that worked great. Then you made a division, did you make a division delta? Yeah, delta. So uh, this was the most threatened side. And the radio traffic was minimal because that battalion 41 came in and I was uh, on engine nine. He had all of us, he was just talking to us face to face the whole time. There was minimal radio. The only radio traffic was between him and Hummel. And so some of the things to think about, though, down at the task level, your, your back stretch, you're setting up your working line, you've got a lot more room to work, but don't get too confident about that because we had three hose lines here, and we had one on floor two, and we had two on the second floor. Heads up, uh, engine 42 pulled their line to this stairwell over here and came up that way. So we didn't have three lines going up the stair same stairwell. That's the great thing about the breezeway, a lot of room. But after about 10 minutes of fighting fire and you know, people moving around, that thing, two of them were in a total knot. It was, it was a surprise that we could get two hose lines so tied up. Uh, I was on floor two, though, so mine was fine. But anyway, um, 19, same, same as alcove, 1970s on, typically wood frame construction. Uh, if we have the breezeway involved, what do we expect? Where are we going to find victims? We're going to find them. Um, oftentimes, these will have balconies. Uh, 
first floor. They'll go right out on the patio. And we have, two, I think I've got a picture of uh, Marketplace, Market Street. Correct? Uh, yeah, okay. This was a fire uh, in Nines District um, on a shift though. Um, fully involved, they had, uh, uh, ended up being a fatality fire. There was an uh, occupant in here that couldn't make it out. She was disabled. And then um, they did, on their walk around, found a person out here on a balcony. And she was fairly threatened, right? Yeah, it, the, the good news was they didn't really fire attack. The, the driver yeah. actually rang the ladder. Yeah, yeah the, the, the driver, while the captain and firefighter were attacking that fire, took the ladder, threw it to the Charlie side, got that lady off. So um, that's, that's the kind of things we're looking for and thinking about when we hear breezeway. All right, the last one is an exterior hallway. This is just your classic motel, right? Two to three stories, I, I guess one story uh, also. So you exit out onto a balcony or onto the, the sidewalk and your exterior hallway is your balcony. And that's going to be, we start seeing these happen, you know, after, uh, after World War II, everyone's traveling, there's prosperity, lots of travel, so motels start popping up all over the place. So we're starting to see these pop up in the 50s and on, usually going to be wood frame. Uh, some of the implications of these are uh, that you're going to have a stairway here and over here, right? Um, occasionally you have one in the middle. Mm -hmm. With the hose stretch, getting the hose up to, if that apartment's on fire, it's going to be a long haul. So if I heard exterior hallway, I'd be thinking, oh, this is probably a place where uh, I, I don't, when I was on the engine, I didn't do a lot of vertical stretches, uh, only for certain situations. But this would be one of them. And the vertical stretch could be as easy as we go dump the hose uh, bundle right here, go up with a pike pole, and we hook it and pull it up. or what I preferred was we take our own bundle. Do you guys have your own, do you have a, like a prepackaged bundle of uh, how, how many feet? Uh, they're individual 50 foot sticks. 50 foot sticks, yeah. all right. Uh, inch and three quarter? Yeah. Do you have any two halves, two and a halves? Uh, not in those companies. We okay. Good, yeah, because I think you're going to, you, you would end up using the inch and three quarter way more. Sure. Um, not that the two and a half is, doesn't have its place, it does. There's, um, I don't want to get in that debate today, but. Uh, that is going to be one of the decisions you have to make along the way is what size line do I need. But this is, why would I not need, probably not need a two and a half if this thing is on fire right here? Hopefully it's compartmentalized. One, one yeah, it's compartmentalized. So it's not going to be a huge, wide open, uncompartmented space where I need to punch it in the face with a two and a half. Um, I like taking the bundle up and uh, my firefighter can be setting up the working line I can drop the coupling over, the driver makes the connection. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that you can be thinking about because you know, you heard on the rate initial radio report, this is what you got. Uh, what about people being trapped? Yes, no? Could, yeah. I mean, there's, you look uh, on the internet, tons of pictures of fires where it's ripping out of here and it's gone up here and it's like, <laughs> Extending, so that person's definitely trapped. This one actually is kind of sp spooky, though, because if this person's trapped, where are they going? Nowhere. They're going to the Charlie side, unless there's a balcony on that. There's it's front side, back side, extra hallway, right? If there's a balcony on that side with other rooms back there. They're stuck in there. So hopefully it's one side. They can get to a balcony or whatever. Now we know we got a lot of rescues to do on. Uh, that Charlie side. If not, if it's front side, back side, now I know I've got to take care of that fire right now. What about those double doors that are usually between room to room? Uh, yeah, but they lock both on both sides, right? So, um, I mean, yeah, if they could get through it. Yeah. They're going to have to have, the question was, are those fire doors at all? I mean, I imagine it's got to have the one hour. Uh, yeah. I, it's got to match the, the partition, yeah. But it, again, and this is, um, like I told you, code is mysterious. Every time I go and talk to one of our code experts, 
their answer is always like, well, <laughs> it depends. Like, I just want one time to get an absolute yes or no answer. Well, it, it depends, like what, you know, and I like a lawyer. yeah, so it should be a one hour rated uh, fire uh, door assembly, right? But they can go down to 20 minutes and I don't know why and what, you know, trade-offs they have to do or whatever. But any questions on garden or safe center hall? Because we're going to go over that a little bit later. Garden apartments, any questions? All right. Does that make sense about being able to identify and understand the tactical implications and why they're grouped together? Okay. I switched your phone. I switched your phone. I had to take your gigantic case out because it was too big to fit in the thing. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk about old style and converted real quick here. Okay, so there is a difference uh, between old style and converted, um, typically in the same era, so that historic and industrial era. Uh, but the, the big difference is old style apartments were built to be an apartment building to begin with versus a converted is maybe a larger home that they converted into a multifamily dwelling. And, and I imagine you guys have them. We certainly have tons of them, especially in North Boise, where it's older uh, construction and the old style um, is actually a little bit better. Like, do you think this was a single family dwelling to begin with? No, no, this, this was meant to be an apartment building to begin with. Um, whereas that converted usually um, was a single family dwelling and then converted. Most of the time, wood frame or ordinary. What we've got going on here in this particular building is it's really like an alcove style apartment where you have the alcove in here where your stairs are. It's just an enclosed alcove. So you walk through the door there and you have an open stair that goes top to bottom. Uh, and then you can see there's a basement in this building as well. What do you think about that? Do you think that was originally intended to be uh, an apartment building? No. It was a frat house, actually. Boise State used to be where St. Luke's Hospital is today. And this was a frat house because it's on like 3rd Street, I think. Uh, but this wasn't originally intended to be a multifamily dwelling. This was converted into uh, an a, a, uh, apartment building. Where do you think the stairs are in this guy? Probably, yep. Right, go in the front door, there's stairs. Do you think there's other stairs somewhere else? Yeah, you got to have some type of secondary. It, it is such a challenge to try to figure out how it's laid out. It's not like this. This was intended to be an apartment building to begin with. You, this actually has, you know, your stairs here, and then each individual apartment has a throat on the backside with balconies. Actually even has the, the slope of the porch back in the old icebox days before uh, refrigerators the ice man would deliver the block of ice and they had their ice box on the back patio. And as the ice melted throughout the week, there was a slope to that so it would drain off into the courtyard. Uh, but nevertheless, trying to figure out the layout of where the specific apartments are and where the stairs are in a converted is a major challenge. So um, I don't know how often you guys break into functional supervisors like Division Alpha, Division Bravo, or F Fire Attack Group, or anything like that. But um, what we teach in our city for the BCs, the ICs, uh, this is screaming for a Fire Attack Group, so we're not trying to tie it to a specific section of the building, because I don't know how that's laid out. I mean, it, who knows where they shoehorned a stairwell to make this attic another apartment that didn't used to be an apartment to begin with, right? So this is more uh, screaming for your second in-bat chief or command officer to be a fire attack group where he can get on the ground and figure out, okay, I'm reading the smoke in the building. I need a line going in here through Delta. I need a line over here as opposed to it's very predictable. And in this one, uh, this, all these apartments are accessed off of Washington Street here. These apartments are accessed off 13th Street. This could be Division Alpha. This could be Division Delta and that. All bets are off on this. I don't know how that's laid out. So I would make my fire attack group so that he can organize it and pop his head in some doors and figure out how he wants to, to do it. I would just add, imagine what uh, 
the assignment of primary search would look like here. Mm -hmm. Nightmare, right? So my next uh, assignment would be a rescue group. So I can have a guy coordinating like, okay, I need you to take uh, that apartment there. Um, guessing you guys will, that they'll be yes. But I'm gonna start trying to figure out all the areas and make sure I got it covered. And I'm not gonna be super confident that I, that I did it, but probably better than assigning a bunch of individual companies to go in and accomplish the, uh, the primary on their own separately. Another thing about this that makes it really dangerous, so um, as we kind of mentioned, I'm a little bit of a history nerd, and uh, if you look at New York City's history, they have old law tenement buildings and they have new law tenement buildings. And the, the dividing line was 1901 when New York City passed the New Law Tenement Act. And the reason for that was the number of deaths they were having in these old law tenements. And it really became exposed by the book, How the Other Half Lives, which was you know, chronicling the uh, Lower East Side's uh, immigrant population and the conditions they lived with multiple families shoehorned into these old law tenements. And he had a series of pictures. That's when the flash bulb was invented in the late 1800s. And so he was able to take pictures of these people that were sleeping in these horrible, deplorable conditions. And when they had a fire in these buildings, they were just horribly catastrophic. So when they passed the New Law Tenement Act, they said no longer in a, in a new law tenement, you cannot have the basement connected to the same stair that's going up to floors one, two, and three. Had to be separate access. Okay, so a new law tenement in New York City does not have a connection between the basement and the living areas. Well, in this building, this was built new enough. I want to say it was like the 1912 or something like that. This basement is a separate access like you'd see in the new law tenement. However, in this old converted, which was built in 1899, this basement, when you walk in the front door, the main stair, there's a, I don't know if I have a picture of it. There's uh, behind that stair going up is the stair to the basements down below. Additionally, uh, they have Wayne's coating and urethane's really pretty. It's beautiful, the woodwork that is going there. But that's your, also your egress corridor, right? That was a contributing factor to the children dying in the Our Lady of Angels fire. And so one of the retroactive actions they changed is they had to abate all the old urethanes and flash fi flashy finishings from the schoolhouses. Um, the last thing was the New Lock Tenement Act required a wired skylight above that public access stair so the fire department could quickly and easily vertically ventilate that egress pathway through the skylight. Well, you don't have that in an old style converted. So you have some of these conditions. I just bring out the New York City thing because some of those same characteristics that made the old law tenements so dangerous are gonna exist in your converteds and you guys probably have them. So just an awareness of what you have and, and why that's so dangerous. So row homes, um, these really span the gamut from historic up to modern and it depends on whether it was built under the IRC or if it was built under the IBC, whether or not it'll have sprinklers, but it's really a function of, are these individually owned or are they rented out? If they're rented out, it was probably building code, they probably have a 13R system. Uh, if they're owned, they probably have better fortifications, uh, separations between the units, but they don't have sprinklers as the trade-off. Uh, let's see. You were talking about the name. What's that? The name. Rojo? Oh, yeah, some people call them townhomes. Uh, Brannigan doesn't particularly like the term townhome uh, because depending if you're talking to the real estate agent or you're talking to uh, the construction tradesman, uh, it's all over the place. Row home, we called it, we landed on row home, two to four stories in height. We landed on row home because it's so intuitive. It's a row of homes. So we're all on the same page. There's no, oh, are we talking a condo, a townhouse? We just call it a row home if it's built that way. And you guys do have them. We saw some as we were driving in today. Um, let's see. Just a couple other examples. Pretty bomber firewalls here, right? Which is unique because that, that is not in our, our uh, residential code. That's not, a, that's not a condo. Those are actually apartments. Yep. You can also have, you can see garages. 
The, the important thing to recognize, though, when you look at um, a row home is, you know, if you have a fire on the first floor here, there's no separation between one and two, right? So your priority, especially middle of the night, kitchen's usually on the ground floor, usually. Uh, sleeping area's usually upstairs. No separation between floors, public stair, kind of, you know, that uh, free access. So your priority is your sleeping area is upstairs. Um, it's not so much extension to Bravo or Delta as much as it is the upper floors in a row home, right? Can I use this to drag on that? So where do fires yeah. typically happen? Can everyone see this? Kitchens, right? Sleeping areas up here. And so um, we, uh, you guys use Reese OBS, like, so we're gonna worry about rescue, life safety, then exposures, confined, extinguish overall. So what we see with a lot of newer officers is they would send the first line here, but oh, okay, now I need to deal with exposures. Um, well, your focus should be entirely on this because what do I have here and here? Firewall. Firewall, if it is the, if it's a, uh, a condo if it's under the residential code even if it's under the building code and it's, it's an apartment i'm at least going to have some kind of fire separation here with some kind of rating and i'll probably have at least draft stopping somewhere in here this is where i would read the roof fence and if the draft stopping's here i'll prioritize this as my first exposure to deal with but my first hose lines probably first two first one to deal with the fire next one going up the stairs and then i would expect Whoever is assigned primary, uh, if there's no access, because these are open stairs and protected, that they would be on the Charlie side throwing ladders, VESing, right? So, on those exposures, would you um, try to pressurize them? The I love it. Um, yes, I think that's a good technique. Now, for us uh, in Boise, I don't think we haven't. Quite gotten there, but that's that is an idea. That's a really good idea. It, uh, pressurizing, kind of like pressurizing stairwells, it keeps the smoke out of it, right? So uh, we want to be very careful. Um, if it's up in the attic, I'd probably be a little bit more cautious about that because I don't want if there's any uh, outlet in there, I don't want to fuel the fire. But yeah, pressurizing this does uh, keep it confined. So it, that's where it gets into if. If it's built under the International Residential Code and these are individually owned, it's a firewall between every separation, which is why there's no sprinklers. If it's a condo where it was built under the International Building Code, then you're governed by the no greater than two apartments or 3,000 square feet. So you would likely have your firewall here and this is open. Does that make sense? So if it's IRC and these are individually owned, I have a firewall here and here. I don't see the real purpose of pressurizing here and here because you have a firewall. That's pretty bomber, right? Between Whereas I can see the point that might be made if it's IRC, um, you know, where you, you have that opening. But again, as Mike mentioned, I would be a little bit nervous about um, pressurizing with the attic space. But uh, here, years yeah. ago, Forest uh -huh. in the old section of town ended up catching on fire. Radio Shack was right adjacent to it. They had a big old firewall, but these are buildings that were built in old, the, old historic, yeah. late 1800s or uh -huh. early 1900s, real early. And uh, they had drilled holes through the wall between the two um, buildings or businesses and smoke went into the radio shack. And so I had a Stuart Rose class several years ago, uh -huh. and he talked about trying to pressurize buildings to um, pretty much protect inventory and all that Interesting. stuff. Interesting. Even though there was a firewall there, it had cracks. Or yeah, especially that old historic era and like so, that, yeah. And they lost all their merchandise. They had it actually in a fire sale. It was over $100,000 worth of wow. merchandise that um, pretty much lost that's pretty interesting i mean you think about the old ordinary you got tons of voids in the old ordinary but if you're talking about pressurizing the uninvolved and you're confident there's no involvement in that area i can totally see the physical point in that you know uh the last thing and i know we need to take a break we kind of blew through our last uh, one did you, you didn't talk about 
Sorry, that's what I was trying to get at. Um, again, we could have come up with 20 different categories, but then it'd become very onerous, it'd be a huge training thing, it'd be a nightmare. We, we didn't try to do that. We really tried to focus on tactical implications, so we tried to keep it simple. But there's gonna be all kinds of different layouts out there. I think this is a fiveplex, so that's what we'd call it. If you know, you call it a fiveplex. Otherwise, you just call it multifamily. Uh, and then maybe on your follow-up report after a 360, you see what's going on, you give a little bit, paint the picture a little better with your follow-up report. But not everything is gonna fit into, this is like kind of like center hall, if I remember correctly, but it looks like a row home. This one has a huge, you know, lengthwise basement in it. It's like, I don't even know what that is. Is that up Boise Avenue, is that the one? Yeah, it's demolished. Oh, yeah, so anyway, we didn't try to come up with a, a category for everything. So we would advocate just call it what it is. If it's a fiveplex, call it a fiveplex. Be, as, be uh, as specific as you can, but without forcing. Yeah. Is that okay? So if it's, all you can say is multifamily volume, you can quantify it as a fiveplex. This is probably a good place for a break, huh? Yeah. 